Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a new product slash model showcase video for this 1.6 scale M27 recoilless rifle with the M22 long tail trailer. The model that you see here is a new full 1.6 scale 3D printed kit from EastCoastArmory.com and is found via the links listed below. In this video I'll go over the kit components as well as the completed model that we have here. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging from 135th scale all the way up to 1 6th scale. As for availability and pricing information, this information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around the model. And this model here is the M27 recoilless rifle. However, this is not your average M27, as this version is mounted on the M22 long tail trailer. The M27 itself was a 105mm recoilless rifle, which was developed by the US military towards the tail end of World War II. During this time, the most effective infantry anti-tank weapons that were available were either the shoulder-fired bazooka, the towed 37mm anti-tank gun, and the heavier 57mm towed anti-tank gun. By this point of the war, the German tank designs were featuring tanks with heavier armored steel plates, and weapons like the 37mm were already by this point woefully inadequate, and even the 57mm was going to have a hard time at punching through some of these new German tank designs. Weapons like the bazooka were very effective, however, did have some issues with them due to the size and shape of the shaped charge. Around this time, the US military started looking into the recoilless rifle concept, which utilizes a very large, heavy caliber type of a weapon, like a 75 or 57. However, rather than mounting it inside of a wheeled carriage with that of a lock breech system, the recoilless system vents all of the propelling gases out of the rear section of the weapon, similar in concept to that of a shoulder-fired bazooka. By doing this, you get the type of velocity and armor penetration power of a standard velocity shell, but with the lightweight capability of the bazooka. The first recoilless weapon system to be utilized by the US was the M18, the M18 was a 57mm shoulder-fired weapon, and this weapon system was very popular with the units that it was deployed to. With this feedback, Ordnance Corps went ahead and greenlit the development of further recoilless weapons, but in larger calibers. The next unit to be developed was the M20, and the M20 was a 75mm. However, unlike the M18, which was shoulder-fired, the M20 utilized that of the M1917 tripod. Still, even though the unit was a lot more cumbersome than the M18, it was still more than capable of being deployed by a small squad of men and was a lot lighter compared to an equivalent weapon with that of a lock breech system and a wheeled carriage. The M20 was also fielded at the very closing weeks of World War II. And while the M20 and M18 programs were under development, a larger 105mm recoilless weapon concept was also being developed at the same time by the U.S. Ordnance Department. This weapon was designated the T-19. Regrettably for the T-19, the war ended before it was able to get adopted and complete its development. The program was shelved and then sat idle. Fast forward to the Korean War period, the U.S. military needed something to take care of the Russian-made T-34s. The T-19 was dusted off and completed its evaluation where it was adopted and got the name M-27. Now the M-27 was the largest of these three weapon systems that were developed and was also the heaviest. However, even though the weapon system was unable to be man portable, it was still more than adequate at being mounted onto a Jeep, which would give it effectively anti-tank fighting capabilities, and was also being developed for that of a wheeled towed trailer. 
The trailer was designated as the M22, and there were two versions of this trailer that were developed. The one that we have here is referred to as the Long Tail Trailer. The M27s went into full production and were fielded by the US military. They were not, however, in service for very long. By the mid-1950s, they were phased out and replaced with its successor, the M40 106mm recoilless rifle. A decent number of M27s were produced before production ended, and several of them are still in firing service today and are used by the Forestry Service to deal with avalanche control on the peaks of some mountains in the United States. As for the M22 trailer, I'm not aware of any of these trailers that have survived or left in existence. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on the model's raw kit condition. And here are all the components of the kit strewn out on the table just prior to the assembly of the model. As one can clearly see, this model is a lot more elaborate in its part layout and is also a lot more larger with many of its sub-assemblies compared to the other releases that I've released in the past, namely that of course being the M40 series. Now many of the sub-assemblies are going to be very similar in concept to that of the M40 as the M27 basically was the predecessor to that weapon system. However, to get a good idea on the main components themselves, let's go ahead and get a closer look at all these components and sub-assemblies because there's a lot of really cool stuff going on over here. Because of the size and complexity of this kit, trying to get everything in frame on the table is going to be very difficult. So we're first going to start with this half here of the table. All the components that you see on this section over here are what's required to build the M27 recoilless rifle itself. The remainder of the components on this side here are for that of the M22 trailer. Starting with the M27, the two most substantial printed components are that of the rear receiver section and the bottom mounting base. Starting with the receiver section, very similar in concept to the M40 kit that was recently released. On the M27, I went ahead and wanted to incorporate as much detailing as possible to be on a single printing. By doing this, this simplifies the actual complexity of the kit, and it also simplifies it for that of an end user standpoint. With all of these detailing installed onto the piece already, the builder does not have to worry about cleaning and prepping these components to, for that of assembly. You just pick it up and you could proceed from here. Some of the details that we have here, starting with, is that of the inner chamber section. You'll notice that it is a total hollow printing, just like on the M40. And just like on the M40 kit, I have here integrally printed on that of its locking lug detailing, as well as the Venturi system. The little slot for the extractor is also present as well as the hinge mechanism and the firing sear mechanism. Now what's cool on the M27 is that unlike on the M40 in which the sear mechanism is sealed off, on the M27 it is completely exposed and the firing cable runs along the receiver here and via a linkage and a clevis connect to the sear mechanism. As you can see the sear mechanism has its little flange piece integrally printed on and no prep work is required. Just like with the firing clevis, you can see here the cable clamps are integrally printed and are nice and hollow so that you could just run the cable right across without having to worry about opening these up via a Dremel. On the bottom here we have its mounting pivoting system, which will be for the bottom base, which I'll be getting to. Note the geometry here of these cutouts. And on the top portion here, we have this linkage system, which will connect to the elevation bar mechanism. And this little tower over here is for that of mounting on an optic. Again, everything is pre-drilled out. And the way you see it here is fresh out of the packaging and no prep work was done to this component whatsoever. Moving from the rear receiver now takes us to the main bottom base. This is probably one of the coolest features on this kit in that I was able to get a 
just like with the receiver, a lot of detailing already completed on this component. Now, this is one of those things where if this was done with the older pattern of tooling, i.e. with resin, each and every one of these components would have to be a sub-assembly, which would need it to be casted, prepped, and then mounted to the bottom base in order to get it up to this condition here. As you can see, that is not the case with this type of tooling, and I'm able to get insane amount of detailing on this piece, and it'll be one integral printing. This really does help cut down on the complexity of the kit immensely. I can't stress that enough. The bottom base is comprised of really two pieces. We have the bottom portion and, of course, the upper portion of the base. The bottom portion of the base is actually what connects to the M22 trailer or possibly even a Jeep. And the top portion that we have here is where the gun and all the elevation and rotation system are connected to. On the real unit, this whole piece would rotate. And that feature is also built into the ECA kit. As you can see, there's a runner here, and you clip these pieces off. Clip these two runners off over here, and the piece will then be able to fit and via a mounting fastener, you can pivot and rotate the upper section. On this portion here, you can see these two clamp mechanisms. These two are for holding on to that of the rear section here of the receiver section. And these two units that are integrally printed on are the pins for that of the hinging section of the receiver that I just showed. You'll notice it even has the little wing nut detailing that is actually kept in place with that of this other portion on the real M27. These are retained fasteners and I built this detailing into the model. On this section over here. These here are the mounts for that of the elevation system, which I'll be going over shortly. And here we have the rotation mechanism, which is a very elaborate component. The reason why this has to be this elaborate has to do with that this gun can be fired in two ways, for indirect fire and direct fire. Because of that, you have to have a redundancy with its components on both sides of the weapon. Now, here we have a dial in the back for dialing in the rotation and on this section here would be that for a hand crank which I have over here. Notice on the hand crank we have here the knob which is integrally printed on and you'll see it has a solid section over here which is used as a weight. This is typically done on many type of crank wheels from mills and lathes to also artillery pieces are no different. Here we have the support arm bracket that comes out. It's got its fastener detailing present. It runs into this gearbox transmission over here, which on the real unit would have a gear on the inside, and this is what would help rotate the system. Now, what's the most interesting bit is this upper half over here. This here is some kind of a handbrake mechanism, and you can actually lock the system in place and it's this very elaborate and complex method of linkages and arms, and it's mechanically very, very interesting. And again, all the detailing was replicated and printed as one unit, so as a model builder, you don't have to worry about having to fiddle around with all of these very minute little features here. On the top portion, we have these two eyelets. The purpose of these has to do with that of retention chains for that of the pins that hold onto the elevation system. This will definitely be more visible once the model is completed. Now, also included is that of a data plate that we have here. Just like with the M40, the data plate is made of, again, of 3D printed HD material. And because of that, the the information is actually fully legible on this component, which will definitely pop and shine after everything is painted. More information on that is, of course, to come. Moving from the bottom base now takes us to the elevation system. The elevation on the M20 system is actually done via a tower. And the tower has these two shock absorber type systems that are connected via this bridge. The shock absorbers themselves have all of their detailing present, including their little miniature gearbox system and their fasteners. As 
As for the tower, we have here an, another little eyelet, which is going to be that for a chain for this little lock pin. And this lock pin locks into this portion over here, which will then connect to this section here on the receiver in this format. Everything is hinged together as follows and should be fully functional once totally completed. Now, in addition to that, you'll notice that there are two springs that are supplied with the kit. These springs are to be used just like they would be on the real unit. Springs get fitted inside of the channel and when they're not falling out, you can see how the unit is actually going to be spring assisted, which definitely aids with the mechanical setup of the kit. Now, moving on from the shock tower takes us to the elevation crank wheel. The elevation crank wheel is molded, or I should say printed in the HD material, it has its correct geometry to it. It's a little knob. Now you'll notice it's actually two pieces in one. This section here is that of the crank wheel, and we have a little bit of runner here which will get clipped, and then you actually have this bar. This bar is what connects these two units together via the small little gearbox that we have here. And on the real unit, by rotating this, you actually turn both of these gearboxes in unison, which helps elevate or depress the gun. On this section over here, we have here some more components. Here we have the fastener, which is going to be used for that of the upper and lower bases. We have here a substantial length of chain for that of all the little chain retaining components that are going to be featured on this kit. Here we have an actual little miniature cable. This is going to be that of the firing cable, which again is how the unit is fired for the direct fire mode. This here is the front trigger mechanism. It gets mounted towards the front section of the weapon system and it is fired via this twist handle that we have here. This twist handle connects the clevis and linkage to that of the receiver and with a simple twist of the wrist, this actually fires the weapon. Moving down, we have here the breech opening and closing lever. It's a lot different in geometry compared to the later M40 system, but it does the, it works in a the exact same way. Moving down takes us here to the breech and the hinge mechanism. Now, if these two pieces look similar, that's because these are actually recycled from the M40 kits, as the M27 units were almost identical. On the hinge, we have here the extractor mechanism, which is integrally printed. and has all of its little camming detailing found on the inside portion here, which is again is found on the real M27 set. And here goes the breech block with its matching locking lugs and its firing pin detailing. Just like the these two components, another piece that's recycled from the M40 is that of the, the breech locking nut. It does the exact same purpose and again is actually, I believe, interchangeable between the M27 and the M40. Moving down here, we have the barrel tip. Again, this is another M40 carryover piece. Moving towards this section, we have here the front optic mount. It's a very elaborate system and being made in this HD material, it's kind of difficult to see all the detailing that is present on this piece. If we notice there's this little dovetail section over here, that is for the fitting of the optic, which can actually slide into this mount that we have here. Now the optic itself is also extremely detailed be better witnessed once fully painted, but we can also see that the piece has its rubber eye cup and sunshade pieces that are molded in rubber, and they are temporarily fitted over the section here for the purposes of filming. Of course, these are going to be, these are separate and get glued on once everything is painted. Now the optics are painted with, or I should say, are printed with a HD material because being 
clear and translucent. This greatly helps the realism of the piece when it comes time for finishing. You don't paint the lens sections, and by doing this, the piece has a very realistic looking appearance to that of the optics. This was a tip that I learned from doing my experiences doing the M40 series, and I transferred it over to this of the M27. Now, this optic here would be used for direct fire. For indirect fire, we have this optic that we have here. This optic is the same type of optic which is used on other American artillery pieces of World War II. This is a very detailed piece and definitely a lot of work went into designing this part when I was modeling everything. A lot of the detailing will pop out once everything is painted. But again, just like with the other piece, it's made in the HD material. Again, for detail fidelity, but also for that of, again, the optics. Now, in addition of the optics, we also have here the little bubble levels on either side here. The purpose of these are for actually leveling of the artillery piece so that you can make sure that when you're dialing everything in, the optic is properly calibrated. Just like the other optic, there is a rubber eye cup that gets fitted to this section here. And this definitely will be a lot more appreciated once everything is fully built and painted. Another bit of detailing is that of the optic mount that we have here. This is the mount that the rear optic actually dovetails into. And this unit here actually connects to the front section here of the receiver. Moving from those systems now takes us to the front clevis mount. These little clevises that we have here are what connect the cable to that of the firing mechanism and are integrally printed with all of their detailing. They are pre-drilled out. Moving from the clevises now takes us to the barrel sections. The two sections we see here are two lengths of pre-cut and pre-sized PVC tubing. And they simply get mounted to the appropriate locations on the kit. Here we have a selection of wire brads. These are to be used all throughout this model as that of the grease and zerk fittings which would be found on a few of the locations. More information on that is of course to follow. And of course there is a length of wire for other smaller fittings and details which again will be discussed once everything is fully completed. With the M27 components now out of the way, it's now time to shift focus to the other half of this model, which is that of the M22 trailer. Starting with the biggest component on the system is that of the tail. The tail that we have here is again one integral printing. It has all of its detailing present, including the toe eye, its adjustment handles, the support columns with braces as its cleaning stave socket and it also has its cleaning stave mounts. Now the mounts are non-functional but all of their detailing are present. On the bottom portion here we have more bracing support rods. We have here the mounting points for that of the base of the trailer and we have here the pins that hold everything in place. Now there are two pins. The other pin is integrally printed and just popped off during shipping. But it's on a runner. You just clip it off. And this is the component that actually locks everything together. Also on the tail, we have here the rear spade. Which would dig into the dirt. Like which is common on other artillery pieces. Moving from the tail now takes us to the trailer's main body, or the chassis, I guess you could call it. The piece, you can notice, has all of its welds thoroughly present. This does give a lot of detailing to this component here. And here we have the locks for that of the, the base that we have here. 
everything is fully drilled out. Now, it's important to point out that this is a pre-production sample and some revisions need to have been made to this component here for the production units, namely that of how the components are laid out. Originally, this was supposed to have another runner under this section here with the components in order to complete this unit. However, there was some issues with the way the pieces were designed and I had to modify the design so that the runners were no longer present. The runners for the production units will not be connected to this and will be separate pieces like this runner that we have over here. The other runner will contain these other components that are present on this pre-production sample. However, the way the parts break down as follows. This little clevis arm here will be connected to this section here and we'll actually have the arms that will spring be spring loaded and and lock onto the bottom base these two units that we have here are the actual wheel mounts for that of the trailer now what's unique about the m22 trailer is that the wheels mounted to it in a very distinctive way. Unlike other trailers out there which they have a suspension or some kind of a, a drum type mechanism, on the M22 trailer the wheels were actually semi-removable. You had this claw and lock mechanism and these pieces here would actually clip into place and then there would be a spring assisted latch would, which would lock everything in position and it would be a nice strong sturdy mounting. This design was carried over into the ECA piece, and this was something that was taken directly from the actual tech manual for this trailer. Here we have another data plate, which is for the trailer itself. And again, this will be discussed in further once everything, of course, is built and painted. Like I said before, the pieces are spring assisted and locking in place and we have here two extension springs which are going to be using or facilitating this purpose. Here we have another runner. This is of the rear travel lock which would be mounted in this section over here. Again, more information on that is to follow. Here you can see the parts are all have all their holes present and are ready for assembly directly out of the box. Finally, the last bit of detailing is that of the wheels themselves. The wheels are an M38 pattern, this being a late 1945 slash post-war design, the M38 wheels would be a lot more appropriate for a vehicle like this. The hubs are, again, printed. They have their correct trailer hubcap present. And the tire is that of the ECA rubber Jeep tire. Also supplied are the two little rubber valve stems for that of the air pressure. Now, these pieces are also pre-tapped as they will be bolted together with that of Allen bolts. And you can see the way the piece is designed. It's designed for the bolts to be utilized for this application. Now, another thing to point out is that this being a pre-production prototype, one of the changes I need to have been made for it was some of the detailing on the wheel here did not transfer over from the CAD files to the prints. And of course, on the production units, this was corrected. However, some of these details that I needed to fix with that of the lug nuts on the outside here of the hub and the rivet, dome headed rivet fasteners found on the inside portion of the rim. Again, this was only needed to be done to this pre-production prototype here and the production units will have all these detailing present. Well, that was certainly a mouthful. However, now that that's out of the way, I could now roll up my sleeves and dig into this kit here to get it completed. And here's the model now fully completed. All of the components that were showcased in the previous scene have been fully assembled painted and weathered. Now, one thing to point out at first is that some people may be looking at this and thinking to themselves that the gun is on in reverse on this trailer. As typically with anti-tank guns of this period, they generally have this type of a format. And although I would agree with you that this does look to be the correct orientation of the gun, as it turns out, this 
is the way the unit would have been fielded. And in travel mode, the unit would simply lock into place on its travel lock as such. I know this for a fact as while I was designing the kit, I actually was able to acquire the official tech manual for this weapon system. And in the tech manual, you can see the unit. Let me get it on. Right here in its illustration with its 1950s illustration goodness. And you can see it both in transport mode as well as also firing position. Also as a really quick and awesome side note, in said tech manual, I have here the 105 millimeter GMC T106 carrier, which I didn't even know existed until this tech manual came in. And later that same day, I actually had the opportunity to see the real or a, a clone of the real T106 at a local military vehicle show. Of course, that video is posted on the ECA channel and it's definitely one I recommend checking out. Starting with the model's rotation, the entire unit can pivot freely on its base. Now, one thing that came out very well on the printings are the tolerances. In fact, you can actually hear the pieces move and have actually a very satisfying type rotation noise to them. The rotation is nice and smooth. It's not jittery or has any type of grit on the pieces, which does make for a nicely engineered model. Moving from the smooth rotation takes us to the detail components of the crank wheels, both the elevation and the rotation cranks. These were installed in a very problem-free and a quick manner. One thing that does contribute to the very speedy nature of the assembly has to do with the fact that pretty much all of the detail components that we see here are integrally printed on the upper mount printing. As for the crank wheel, like what we showcased before, this was one complete piece. However, that is that of a runner and you do have to snip off the crank from the rod at its little break point in order to get the unit assembled on the elevation shocks that we have here. Moving to the model's elevation, the unit does have springs on the inside here, and the entire elevation is spring-assisted. This will, of course, prevent barrel droop and does make for a nicely engineered piece. Now, as for paint, you'll notice that the shocks are actually that of brass. These were This feature was taken directly off of a real M27 that I've seen in person, and from my information, these pieces were brass on all of these units. Moving from the shock absorbers takes us to the data plate. Just like with the data plate on the M40, all of its important information is present, including that of stock number, US property mark, as well as also the manufacturing source. Now, unlike the M40 in which the data plate would have been aluminum, on the M27s, from what I've seen, they were that of cast brass. Moving from the data plate takes us to the shock absorber pins, which are held in place via chain retained units. These are again all stocked with the kit. And from the chains, you can also see all of the grease Zerk fittings that are present, and they are all painted in red. Because of all of the little pivot points found on this unit here, there are a lot of these little grease plugs that are present. Moving along takes us to the trigger mechanism. And what's very cool on the M27 is that the trigger is controlled via an external linkage, which is that of an external steel cable. This differs from the M40 in which the cable was concealed in that of a rubber sleeve. On the M27, however, it is all out there in the open. As for the cable detailing, this is all stocked with the ECA kit. It supplies you with the scale metal cable, the linkages, and what's very interesting is that also, again, unlike the M40, if I can get this in frame here, the linkage system is all out and exposed. With the M40, this is all concealed in that of a plate. As for the trigger mechanism, this is equally as interesting on the M27 compared to the M40 as well as the other recoilless weapons that have been developed over the years. The M27 is distinctive by having this cluster which is clamped onto the rear section here of the barrel. 
this section here is where the unit would actually be fired. And the firing is facilitated by this lever and handle that we have over here. And you can see the linkage connects directly to it. With a simple twist of the wrist, this would actuate the cable on its trigger mechanism, and this would actually fire the weapon. Now, in addition to being the mount for the trigger mechanism, it's also the mount for that of an optic. This very small optical sight that we have here is used for that of direct fire. The optic is mounted to the optic mount via the little dovetail section, just like on the real unit, and it makes for a very realistic assembly. Here you can see the unit now fully painted, and with its rubber eye cups mounted. Now the one in the back of course is for eye protection and the one in the front is actually a glare reducing system. What's also very interesting on the real unit is that you can actually adjust the pitch of the optic via this knob. By rotating this knob, either tightening it or loosening it, this moves a bolt which positions this optic mount system to the orientation where it needs to be for it to be properly calibrated. These are all separate pieces on the ECA kit which once assembled give for a nice bit of realistic type detailing. Moving on from the front tower now takes us to the secondary indirect fire optic. Here now it's fully painted, you get a chance to see all of the detailing found on the printing. Now, because it is made out of that translucent printed material, just like with the direct optic that we have over here, this does make for the lenses being in a very realistic manner. And on this optic, in addition to the lenses, we also have here the little sections for that of the bubble levels, which definitely pop out once everything is painted. And of course, like with the other optic, it has a rubber eye cup. In addition to this optic being supplied with the ECA M27 kit, it is also offered separately on the ECA product line in case anyone who has a 1-6 scale bit of World War II US artillery or a vehicle like an M10 tank destroyer or an M7 priest, you can now upgrade these vehicles and equipment with this new detail component from ECA. Moving from the optic takes us to the breech area. Just like with the ECA M40, the breech can be modeled in either the open or closed state. The hinge mechanism is not glued and the breech can pivot open or closed. However, the lever is purely just for detail and does not actually lock and unlock the breech. As for the interior detail, you can see the locking lug recesses, which are present on the receiver section as well as on the breech face. And you can also see the firing pin detailing found on the breech block itself. The unit can have the ECA ammunition positioned on the inside. And like was mentioned in the other video, they, you can get them either in a loaded or a spent shell configuration. Moving from the gun itself now takes us to the M22 trailer. Starting with the way the gun mounts to the trailer, the gun is actually not held on with any sort of adhesives or glues. In fact, it is held on just like the real unit via these two clamps here on the back. These two clamps, which on the real unit would be spring mounted, lock the two mounting tabs found on the bottom base of the carriage. And on the front here we have two small little lugs which mount onto the front. This holds the unit on in a very firm manner and like I said before absolutely no adhesives are used. It's very strong and I could pick up the whole unit just from the bottom base. To remove these units unclip. Now on the real unit they would be spring retained in place however for the model that's not necessary. And once those two pieces are unclipped the entire gun simply lifts off of the carriage.
with the gun removed. You can see more detailing on the carriage itself. Starting in this corner here, we have another data plate, which is just for the, the trailer itself. And of course, like the other data plate, all information is legible once fully painted. Moving to the model's wheels, here we can see the M38 pattern of rim with that of the cast rubber tire. Just like on the real trailer, the unit is actually also held on via a pin and no adhesives are used. If I pull this pin out, the entire unit will unhinge and pop off. This is as per the real M22 trailer. And with this system, not only making it more realistic in that regard, it's also the way the wheels, or the rims I should say, are mounted to the wheel base with that of an Allen fastener. With the wheel back onto the trailer, you can now see some more detailing found on the piece, which is that of the little rubber valve stem, which again is supplied with the set. With the wheels on, you can see that the trailer has a very nice roll to it, and it's definitely something that can be easily towed with a radio-controlled vehicle, such as some sort of a prime mover, a truck, or, of course, something like a Jeep. Moving further down the trailer takes us to the stave mounts. Now, these are static, and the staves are not included with this model. And finally, moving to the rear takes us to the travel lock. The travel lock is fully functional with that of its little wing nut and pivoting feature. And it gets mounted directly to the rear section here of the trailer. The remainder of the detailing, namely that of the spade, the carry handles, and the tow eye are all integrally printed. And here's the unit represented in its travel mode. And currently, as you can see, it is hitched up to my Dragon 1.6 scale World War II American Jeep. This model is showcased in an earlier model showcase video, which is found on the channel, as well as was also recently used in a, another video or two. In order to hook up the unit to the Dragon Jeep, this is facilitated with that of the tow hitch. Now, the Dragon Jeep does have a tow hitch detailing represented. However, the Dragon Kit version is that of a static piece. The unit here is the functional piece from EastCoastArmory.com. It simply opens and closes, keeping the unit in place. Now, this unit was designed at the very tail end of World War II, so the use of a Willys Jeep like this one here is perfectly appropriate for towing this weapon system. And for comparison, we have here the M27 in the center. On one side here, we have the M40 recoilless. Now, this would be the unit that would actually replace the M27 with US military service. And on the opposite side, we have another M40, but this one here is configured for a Norwegian pattern with that of a wheeled trailer. As you can see, the Norwegians had the exact same needs and a similar design concept that the US military had in the late 40s and early 1950s for the same benefits. By adding this weapon system to a wheeled mount, this does improve mobility as well as ease for maneuvering a weapon system like this in the field, giving a little bit more flexibility compared to something like this semi-static tripod that we have for the standard M40. Now, like I said in the earlier portion of the video, the M27 was not in service with the US military for a very long period of time. Shortly after the, the system was adopted, a number of years later, it was promptly replaced with that of the M40. Now, there are some theories to why this happened. One of the theories has to do with the ammunition that was used. The ammunition that was developed for the M40 apparently would wear out the chamber section of this weapon system in a short period of time, which is definitely something that is less than ideal. These changes apparently were made to the M40, and the M40 is still in service today with many countries around the world. Now, it's, it's, I've also seen some sources state that the M40 can chamber and fire ammunition for the M27, but not vice versa. This is something similar along the lines to rifles chambered in 5.56 and 2.23, how one can chamber the other, but not the other way around.
Another theory that I came across, which is one that I believe may be more accurate, has to do that while the M27 was cutting edge technology towards the end of World War II, by the early 1950s was really starting to show its age. You can see with just how the unit is assembled and designed. This unit here definitely has its design cues and material choices firmly rooted in the late 1930s and the World War II time period. You can see that with the use of brass for that of the recuperators, as well as many other steel components. The way the pieces are assembled and they're designed are very well done, but require a lot of specialty tooling to create and also tend to be a little bit more over-engineered and overly complicated for what they need to be. The M40, on the other hand, is using a much simplistic design, which does this basically the same functions as all this clutter and equipment over here. All that is facilitated via two simple crank wheels. In addition to that, the material choices used on the M40 represent that of the next generation from the jet age and onward. The M40 utilizes more uses of aluminum alloy components compared to the M27, which again uses more legacy components such as steel and brass. Even the siding system and the trigger system on the M27 was completely simplified to a bare bones representation on the M40. Rather than having those two optics for use for both indirect and direct fire use, that's all facilitated via the spotting rifle and a much simplistic gunner's optic. As for the firing linkage, this is still done via a cable, but the cable is far less complicated and smaller found on the M40 compared to this very intricate and exposed system that we have here on the M27. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video slash new product announcement video of the EastCoastArmory.com 1.6 scale M27 recoilless rifle kit with the M22 long tail trailer. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook where there are more photographs of all these three models that we have here plus all the other small and larger scale builds that have been showcased on the ECA channel in the past. In addition to that, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com where there's more builds, details, as well as full kits available. Thanks for watching.